Platoon Commander Deluxe, The Battle of Kursk, is a two-player tactical level war game that recreates clashes between the Germans and Soviets at the platoon level during the Battle of Kursk on the Eastern Front in 1943. In this game, unit counters represent vehicle, tank, and infantry platoons, as well as support teams. Each hex on the map represents approximately 150 meters, and each turn, 15 minutes of real time. This is a game of low to moderate complexity, and solitaire suitability is medium to high. Let's take a look at the components. Two 11 by 17 inch mounted map boards. The map boards depict a fictional area consistent with the terrain where the Kursk campaign was fought. Thus, the map shows large swaths of open terrain, roads, towns, cities, hills, and cultivated fields. The game includes 252 one-inch counters, showing units representing platoons of tanks, infantry, and combat support troops. Among the counters are various markers used to keep track of various game functions. Let's take a look at the information in a unit counter. This is a Soviet T-34-76 tank platoon. This is the unit's armor piercing factor, which is used when firing at armored fighting vehicles. Below is the unit's high explosive factor, which is used when firing at leg units. On the right side of the counter, we see the armor factor, which represents the unit's armor thickness and difficulty to hit. Below is the close assault factor, which is used in close assault combat. In the bottom center is the unit's movement factor, expressed in movement points. A blast symbol denotes that the unit may move and fire. A circle means that the unit may transport other units. There are markers which are used to denote units that have moved, fired, are disrupted, as well as vehicles that have turned into wrecks, and units that have dug in. There are also markers for aircraft and also focus and aid markers that serve a special game mechanic that we shall see further ahead. The game includes 18 action cards. Each card shows two sections, one that applies to the Soviet player and the other to the German player. Each player may play two cards per turn, and the cards provide unexpected actions and responses. The game includes two 8.5 by 11 inch player aids. One player aid is two-sided and shows various charts and tables. One side shows the terrain effects chart, and the other side has the fire results table, a range color explanation chart, and at the bottom, the close assault table. The second player aid card contains the turn record track, a box where to place the focus marker to influence the initiative die roll, and a summary of the sequence of play. The game comes with six ten-sided dice, which are used to determine the results of fire combat, close assaults, and other game functions. The die results in this game range from 0 to 9. The game includes a 20-page rulebook in full color. The actual rules cover 9.5 pages, and the remaining pages have the instructions for each of the 12 scenarios included with the game. In each of the scenarios in the game, the victory conditions are specified. In some scenarios, victory is achieved by control of certain towns, cities, or hill spaces. In others, by control of certain parts of the map board. And yet in other scenarios, victory is awarded on the basis of victory points. Let's take a look at the sequence of play. Each turn consists of nine phases. 
In the first phase, initiative is determined by having players roll a die with the higher rolling side gaining the initiative. In the draw action cards phase, each player draws enough cards to have their designated number of cards. In the rally phase, both players roll a die to try to rally their disrupted units. In the fire phase, players alternate conducting fire combat attacks and all firing units are marked with a fired marker. In the movement phase, one side moves any and all their eligible units and then the other side may move any or all of its eligible units. All moved units are marked with a moved marker and while units are moving the opposing player may conduct opportunity fire. The phasing player may also conduct moving fire with units identified with the blast around their movement factor. All opportunity and moving firers are marked with a fired marker. In the close assault phase, none disrupted adjacent units not marked as fired may initiate close assault combat and those situations are resolved. In the housekeeping phase, all fired and moved markers are removed. In the aid and focus phase, players may place, flip, move or do nothing with the aid and focus markers provided to them in this game. And finally, in the last phase of the turn, the turn record marker is advanced one space on its track. Let's take a look at some examples of play. Most of the actions in this game have to be undertaken by eligible units. And eligible units are those that are neither disrupted nor marked with any other status marker such as a fired or moved marker. In this example, the reduced Panzer IV platoon is the only eligible unit. When a unit receives its first hit, it is disrupted and we place a disrupted marker on the unit. If the unit receives a second hit, it is reduced. We flip the unit to its reduced side and of course it retains its disrupted marker. If that same unit receives a third hit, it is eliminated and if the unit was an armored fighting vehicle unit, a wreck marker is placed in the hex. Fire attacks against leg unit targets use the fire's high explosive factor. Note that this unit's high explosive factor is 8 encased in an orange box. The orange box denotes the range of that particular firepower. It has a short range of 1 to 2 hexes, normal range of 3 to 4, and long range of 5 to 8 hexes as shown in the range color explanation chart. The attack here is at a range of 3 hexes so the firing unit is in its normal range and there are no column shifts to be applied for range. The target however is in a forest hex. We consult the terrain effects chart which indicates that for forest hexes Leg units in forest receive a two column shift to the left. So we start by locating the unit's firepower in the fire results table, which is eight, and we apply the two column shifts on account of the forest hex. And the attack will be resolved on the four column, and we roll 1d10. The roll is a one, four possible hits. So now we roll 4d10 and if the result of each die roll is higher than the unit's morale, the target will suffer a hit. In this case, the German infantry's morale is 5. So we roll 4d10 and the result is 0, 3, 4 and 6. Only one hit. So the German infantry platoon is disrupted and we place a fire marker on the T. 34 platoon. Here a Panther 5 platoon fires 
on a T-34 platoon. The range is seven hexes. So this will be a long range attack. Long range attacks suffer from a two column shift to the left. In attacks against armored fighting vehicles, we start by taking into account the armored piercing firepower of the firing unit, in this case 10, and we subtract the armor value of the target unit, in this case 4. So this attack begins in the 6th column of the fire results table, and now we apply the 2 column shift to the left on account of long range. So we roll 1d10 on the 2 column, and the result is a 7, one possible hit. Russian morale in many of the scenarios is 3, so we roll 1d10. The result is a 4, so the T-34 platoon is disrupted, and the Panther platoon receives a fired mark. In this example, a T-34 platoon fires at a Panzer IV platoon, and the result of the fire is that the Panzers are disrupted. The T-34 receives a fired marker, and in a later round, in the same fire phase, a second T-34 unit fires at the Panzer IVs. The line of sight of the second T-34 enters the target's hex through a hex side, which is not adjacent to the hex side where the line of sight of the first T-34 entered the target hex. Therefore, the Panzer IV is considered flanked and flanking fire causes one column shift to the right. We see that the firing unit has an armor piercing value of 8, the range is 4 hexes, and the defending unit has an armor factor of 4. We also see that the Panzer IV has a minus 1 superscript. This is its unit specific modifier, and this is beside its armor value. This means that 1 will be subtracted from the die roll on the fire results table. So we start at 8, which is the armor-piercing factor of the attacking unit, and we deduct the armor value of the target unit, which is 4. So we're now at 4 firepower factors, and because of the flanking column shift, there's one column shift to the right. So we're at 6 now, but because this is a long-range attack, there's two column shifts to the left. And here is where the attack will be resolved. On the two column, we roll 1d10. And the roll is a 2, but we have to apply the unit-specific modifier of the Panzer IV, which is a minus 1. So the total is 1. And that produces three possible hits. Notice that the cultivated field hex where the target is located does not provide any column shifts for vehicles, only for leg units. So we roll 3d10 and German morale is 5. The results are a 3 and a 1 which have no effect, but the 6 is higher than the German's morale. So that's one hit and the unit which is disrupted is now reduced and retains its disrupted marker. So we place a fired marker now on the second T-34 unit. In the close assault phase, undisrupted units that are not marked fired may close assault adjacent units. Here we see this Soviet Guards infantry platoon, which will close assault the Tiger platoon, which has a fired marker. And in close assault, we use the close assault factors, which is the number on the bottom right-hand corner encased in a gray box. The guard's infantry has 12, and the tiger platoon, 4. The factors are compared and expressed as a ratio, but there's several things to take into account. As, for instance, the terrain where the defender is, in this case, a city hex, and we take a look at the terrain effects chart in the column of uh, effects or column shifts uh, for fire, combat, and close assault, we see there's a 2 slash 2. The 2 applies only to leg units, so the Tiger platoon will not receive any column shifts on account of terrain. So here the situation is 12 close assault factors of the 
Russian Guard platoon against four close assault factors of the Tiger platoon. So that's a three to one ratio. We roll 1d10. The result is an eight. Four hits are inflicted on the defending Tiger platoon and three hits on the attacking Guards platoon. So we roll four dice to determine the number of hits on the Tiger platoon and morale is five. Zero, three, three, and nine. The nine causes one hit which disrupts the Tiger platoon. Now we check to see how many hits are inflicted on the Soviet Guards infantry platoon. We roll three d10 and morale is three. A three, a six, and a seven. The six and seven inflict hits. So the guard's platoon is disrupted and reduced. And the close assault combat ends right there. Now let's suppose, for instance, that instead of the combat result that we saw now, the uh, tiger platoon suffered two hits, which would have reduced the tiger and also placed a disruption marker, which we placed beneath, and that the guards' infantry platoon suffered only one hit, in which case it would have been only disrupted. In that case, because the defending unit received more hits than the attacker, it must retreat one hex. And now we check to see if the attacker can advance into the hex, but only eligible units that participated in the attack may advance. And the attacking unit had a moved marker, so it's not an eligible unit. But let's say that the attacker did not have such a move marker on it. It may now advance into the vacated hex. In this game, there are 18 action cards which provide different actions that players can undertake during the indicated phase on the card. The cards are organized with the Soviet action on top and the German action on bottom and on the left side it is denoted the phases when the card can be played. For example this card Za Rodinu can be played during the fire or movement phase to remove the moved or fired marker from one hex. So for example here we see a Soviet uh, group of units. This card can be played to remove the fire marker from the T-34 unit. This card, Artillery Barrage, may be played by the Soviets in their fire movement phase to execute a six firepower attack and all artillery barrages in this case affect one hex and two adjacent hexes. So all three hexes where there's German infantry here in the forest could be attacked. However, the German can counter by immediately playing the 999 card, which negates the last Soviet card played, and it has to be played immediately, as is the case here. So in this particular example, the German infantry units are spared a Soviet artillery barrage. In this game, each player receives a focus and an aid marker. The focus marker represents the commander's focus in a specific area of the battlefield. So for instance, let's say that in this particular example, Panzer IV fires on a T-34 platoon, which is four hexes away. And the die roll is an 8, which would have produced in the final two column one possible hit. The German player decides to use his focus marker and flips it to the side that only shows one die. And the die is re-rolled, resulting in a 5, which produces two possible hits. Notice that if the die result would have been worse, for example, a 9, the German player cannot backtrack and has to live with that result and has burned that use of the focus marker. 
Aid markers represent additional medical supplies and encouragement provided to units in a hex. So units in a hex that contain an aid marker may re-roll morale checks during the rally phase. And it's important to remember that the rally phase is the third phase of the turn. So during the aid and focus phase, players can shift and move the aid and focus markers so that they can be useful, for example, during the rally phase. And during the aid and focus phase, players may, if they want, do nothing with these markers or remove one or both of them from the map. Or they can flip the marker to the side that shows two dice. Or they can move the marker to another unit that is three hexes away. If at the beginning of the phase the marker is outside of the map, the player may place the marker on the map on any unit showing the side with one die. Tracks in the Mud is a Battle of Kursk expansion and this expansion includes a mounted map board showing wooded areas and various towns and cities. It also includes a full counter sheet which adds King Tigers, Jag Panthers, Soviet Cavalry, German shock troops, T-3485s, and the Soviet heavy tanks IS-3s. This expansion includes six scenarios that span from 1941 to 1945, and there are even some American infantry and armored fighting vehicle platoons for use in a fictional scenario where they clash with Soviet forces in 1945. Well, we've reached the end of this video. I hope the video has given you a good idea of what the game is about and what it has to offer. This is Stuka Joe signing off for now, and I leave you with the setup for Scenario 6, Mini Stalingrad, Maestro Pancaldi.